Thanks, everyone. So like Richie said, the, the book's called uh, Node Cookbook. Uh, there's two editions. You want the second edition, unless you want to learn about Node 0 0.6. Um, so uh, yeah, I am with Nearform. And been training with them for about a year, but I also do development. I tend to jump on projects. It's good to, to keep kind of fresh as a developer, especially when you uh, do a lot of training. I don't want to just become someone who's theoretical. Um, so, uh, and I also uh, do a bit of consultancy here and there as well and architecture stuff. Um, so Nearform, when I first went started with Nearform, um, I, I came on as the, uh, as a node guy, and, and, and Nearform started off being like a full-on node shop. Um, and we've kind of stumbled into this microservices universe um, because it turns out when you when you're doing. Um, because we we are a consultancy company and we've we've built a fair few projects. Um, whenever you want to create robust systems using Node, it turns out like using lots of little processes is a much better fit than using one big process. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go. Um, but uh, there's this guy, uh, I think it's John McCready, who's famously quoted for saying, the problem is we don't understand the problem. Um, and he's, uh, this was back in like the 50-ish times. So this dude, uh, I think his name was Henry Kramer, said anyone who can build a self-powered uh, uh, aircraft uh, that can fly the English Channel, I'll pay them $100,000. Um, so people were trying to do this, and um, and they would have basically they would they would they would come up with an idea, and they would build the aircraft, and that would take maybe like a year, and then they would try and fly it, and it would crash, and they'd have one data point, and then they'd take another six months rebuilding the plane, and then they try again, and they take another six months, and 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 no one would, and people have been trying to do this for about fourteen to fifteen years to get this hundred grand. Um, so there's a lot of investment and a lot of time had gone into essentially nothing. So John McCready comes along um, and he says, uh, what, what we need to do is speed up the, the way we're iterating. Uh, we, we need to, so he chose materials and he set up rigging that allowed him to iterate quickly. So the first thing, and he, and he used aluminium and, and um, you know, just cheap materials. And his first version didn't work at all. But he was able to iterate within hours instead of months. So he very quickly got to a working version. And then he very quickly after that got, got to a version, it maybe took a year or so, but he eventually got to a version that could actually cross the English Channel. And so he was able to continually improve um, this aircraft. And they're, they're totally parallels to the way he works, to the way um, traditional shops work, and, and the way agile shops, well, I say agile shops, but um, shops that would, would be into tooling and, and, and making sure we can do things faster and more automated. So like I said, um, Nearform have, uh, since 2011, we, we've, we've deployed and, and actively support 50 plus production systems. Um, and we, we've made a considerable amount of mistakes in that process. And we've come across the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the lessons that we've learned as we've gone is that we need to design for iteration the same way that John McCready did uh, with this Gossamer Albatross. Rapid innovation requires rapid feedback cycles. So we, we've, the, the thing that's led us to do microservices are these kind of motivations. How do we, how do we design in a way where we can iterate quickly? Another one is to design for, for measurement. Rapid innovation requires evidence from data to guide the iterations. So uh, there's two products that I'll talk about later that we've built in-house that we offer as open source, um, free, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but we've built them because we needed them f for our deployments instead of reinventing the wheel every time. So part of this is uh, we have a product called Nscale, and, and this is opening up doors to uh, monitoring. Um, so one of the things that, that, we're, that we're working on currently is if you have a lot of microservices and you have um, 
uh, one of them sends a message out and and then some of them respond to that message with a couple of other messages and you know that you have a ratio for instance from one message you have a one to three ratio um, and then you make changes to the system and then the next time you measure this, you actually have a one to four ratio, and that's unexpected, then you know that something's not what it should be. Um, so that's the sort of measuring that we're, we're kind of doing, uh, and obviously uh, monitoring services and all that kind of stuff. So why are microservices so effective, or why have we found them so effective? Because they break down barriers to rapid innovation by delivering value early. These statues are called, I think they're the Marukai, Marukai? let me just see if I can get that name right. Um, anyway, they're Egyptian statues, I've lost my notes. They're Egyptian statues and um, of a particular ferry. Uh, so particular, particular merchants in the, the less, um, less sort of uh, rich uh, northern area of the Nile uh, would have been absolutely fine to have the middle figure and sell the middle figure, um, even though it's pretty much half done. But there's enough value in that middle figure that it represents the, the pharaoh. So we found that we're able to deploy early versions of the system that aren't necessarily completely chiseled out, but that actually provide value and can be worked on. I mean, you could have taken one of these pieces and worked on them even more after that. Um, and so the, the, the allegory here as well is that the, the stone is like time. Once, once you've tip, chipped that away, you can't get that back. Um, so if you have different constraints and your project, you, you, you're not able to deploy until you've got a complete pharaoh, 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 until you've got a complete pharaoh, um, because of certain constraints, then you have to invest all of that time to get something perfect. And that affects your time to market as well. So how many quarters does it take to deliver a CEO initiative? Um, typically in, in sort of traditional um, uh, software uh, shops it, you, you, or, or in department, IT departments and so forth, you're looking at maybe three quarters, three to four quarters to deploy a CEO initiative. Whereas with microservices, you, you, can, you can generally beat that by a big amount. Um, this is this is what we've been seeing. This is not just throwing things out there. This is based on like our experiences uh, with deployment. We've also found that microservices means less code, um, and less code means less debt, and it also means fewer bugs, and it also means it's fewer easier to change. It also means it can be disposable code. So one of the beautiful things about microservices is if you have a developer on your team who's um, still learning the ropes and they write some particularly bad code you can the, the 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 surface area of that code is so small that you can throw it away and rewrite it in a day or maybe in an hour it depends but the idea is that the the um the footprint of these changes to the system and these parts of the system, or you could call them components if you like, um, is small and the boundaries are well defined so they don't have a major impact on the system. Um, so there was a study done, I really must find my notes now. Um, here we go. Oh, that's why. Yeah, so there's a study done by Coverity. I don't know if anyone's heard of Coverity. Um, where they, 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 they had a uh, constant for uh, measuring code quality. And that constant was bugs per 1,000 lines of code. And they found that with, with open source code, um, there was 0.59 bugs per 1,000 lines of code. Um, but with uh, proprietary code, there was 0.72 bugs per 1,000 lines of code. Um, but with microservices, um, 
the, 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 the because they because there's fewer code with those microservices, there's fewer bugs. Does that make sense? I've kind of lost myself a bit there. Let's just move on. <laughs> Forget that happened. So, uh, microservices are the, the perfect software component, or uh, because they're small pieces, they're loosely coupled, and it and it's made deliberately difficult to traverse those boundaries and to get around those boundaries. Whereas in an application, there's a lot of things that you can do to create horizontal state flow and different things that, that couple things too tightly. Yeah, it's still possible to tightly couple microservices, and we've seen a couple of projects that have gone a bit, a bit in that direction. Um, but by, by containing each of these things, uh, we can... Um, we can keep things nice. Um, it's also because of because of JavaScript, because it had no module system. Um, that's allowed over the, over time uh, 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 experimentation with what what's a good module system. And, um, Node's module system is really nice. Common JS is a really nice um, solution to this problem, and particularly the versioning problem. Um, so we can use that together with microservices to create these really nice boundaries. Um, the monolith is what you would call an application that's built all in, in process, or an application that's mainly built all in process with a couple of pieces around the outside. Monoliths tend to be massive, immovable, and unchangeable. That's a space oddity uh, reference. Um, and this, this, is, this is kind of how we would view traditional enterprise architecture. You have this massive ball of mud um, that th there's parts of it that people are too scared to go in and change um, because some dude wrote it five years ago and he's no longer with the company and he was like a wizard, so we don't touch that piece. Um, and on top of that, they're, they're just very big and very tightly coupled. Um, but microservice architectures we found are small, they're agile, they're adaptable. Um, and we would consider this modern enterprise architecture. So microservices in production, we, we tend to deploy, we try the sweet spot for us is between 50 and 150 microservices. Uh, that's what we find is, is most manageable and, and, and solves the, the sort of problems we're trying to solve. Um, so we have thousands of services, but then we have thousands of service instances. Um, and then thousands of message types. Um, everything in the system is transient, so anything, any, the message is temporary, uh, and there are emergent properties. What I mean is that we're, we're able to, um, after building these systems, by merit of the design of the system, um, find useful uh, combinations of data that we might not have identified ahead of time. And the, there are challenges with microservices. Um, when you start down this path, um, sometimes a client will ask you for an architectural diagram. And, and the best we can give them is like a, a, a sort of a vague concept of microservices in a diagram. Because the whole point here is that um, the system is organic. It's like a human cellular structure or an animal cellular structure. Um, it's an organism. Uh, and it becomes too big to understand. It's, it becomes too big to fit in your head. But so do monoliths, right? Um, the beauty of microservices is that if you, if you want to say, let's define what a microservice is, is, a microservice is, it's something that you should be able to keep in your head all at once. And that's the same for a module as well. Um, other challenges is that local and stage and production are all different, but that's no different to any other kind of deployment uh, or any other strategy. Um, with microservices, the, the system is, is, is not deterministic. It's, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen every time, and it's hard to reproduce the thing every single time. Partly that's to do with the asynchronous nature um, of uh, uh, intercommunicating processes, um, uh, and partly it's just to do with that there's so many bits and pieces going on. Um, Testing is actually much less effective in microservices and, and actually can cause a cause drag. Um, so we tend to test the absolutely vital infrastructural parts of the microservices, and then for the business logic, we tend to allow um, uh, business uh, monitoring, like monitoring KBIs, like what's the bottom line, how much money is it making, that sort of thing, to actually validate those sorts of parts of the system. Um, the architecture, as I said, is hard to describe. 
So how do you survive microservices? Think messages, not services. So instead of thinking I have message service A and service B, and I'm going to say I want A to invoke B, that's, that's really um, kind of... Uh, that's, that's a dangerous approach to microservices because it can cause really tight couplings, which is what we're trying to get away from. Um, but when you think messages instead, if you think there are messages in the system, and what, inst what you do is I'm going to do something and I'm going to send this message out, and I don't care who responds to it. And then someone might pick one other service, might pick that message up and say, oh, I got this message. Oh, this, 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 is, this is relevant to my interests. Um, and then it might then throw another message out. Um, the other way, to, the other part, vital part of surviving microservices is just continually automate. We're constantly uh, trying to figure out new ways to automate parts of, these, of the process and uh, of the monitoring and, and the, whole, the whole thing. Prefer to add new services than update old ones, particularly if it's a big add. You don't want to um, a big addition. You don't want to you don't want to grow a microservice so that it does too many things because now it's no longer a microservice; it's a core surface service. Um, even if you're uh, adding like a new version of a service, you, you, it's better to add that than to update a service to a new version um, initially. Monitor message flows. Um, for that, we tend to use InfluxDB uh, for the analytics uh, and test using production traffic. So say you have two versions of a microservice, the old version and the new version. You deploy the new version, and then you duplicate the traffic to both. But the, the old version is still answering the responses, but you're testing the new version to see that it's doing what it should be doing before you deploy it. So Richie sent me a question uh, in an email. Um, and I think you talked to a couple of people um, before uh, sending this question. And the question was, creating services is pretty easy, but how do services communicate and how do you deal with running them in production? How do you deploy updates across numerous services without downtime? So it turns out this is actually three questions. <laughs> <laughs> How do services communicate? How do you deal with running them in production? And how do you deploy updates across numerous services without downtime? So as I said, services talk to each other with message patterns. And the way that we do it is that the messages are simple uh, key value pairs. And the more key value pairs, the more specific the message. So then services theoretically see all messages and choose whether to respond. I say theoretically, I'll explain that later. Um, but because of this, this replaces the need for service discovery. Because it's the service saying, oh right, that message is like specific to, to me. And then you might have a more generic one that says, oh, um, I'm gonna, so say you have, um, key foo and you got a, a message that answers a pattern with a key of foo and then you got another uh, sorry service and you got another service that answers a, a pattern with a key of foo and bar both of them will answer but then your uh, service that is picking up on the messages w will prioritize the most specific one or you can change the way you do it and actually rank them and, and do different things but uh, essentially we don't then have to say oh you're listening to this one and you're listening to this one and, and all that kind of stuff it takes out the big um, service discovery blob that you have to put in the middle of traditional SOA. Um, in terms of transport, uh, as for how services communicate, it depends on the current needs of the project. So the options are point to point, which we tend to do with HTTP or TCP, queuing, which we uh, meshes buses, and, and broadcasting with PubSub. Um, but generally, you want to decouple from the transport layer because that makes switching out easier and it makes um, experimentation easier. Because you might have, it might be better to use a particular transport layer in development and then a different one in production. Um, or it might be better at a different stage of your, um, of your, of, of your thing that you're doing uh, to actually uh, change to a, a different transport. So decoupling is more important than the choice of communication when you're first designing your, your system. Second question was, how do you deploy updates across numerous services without downtime? So rather than update services, to prefer to create new ones. It's okay to run two versions of a service in a production system. Um, so not only could you duplicate traffic and do it that way, but it's actually okay to have two, two services answering messages. Um, some services may be reacting to older service messages, so you can keep those parts of the system uh, and then have like a, a key with like V2 or something like that to answer the, the new message. 
messages, and that's, that's actually turns out to be okay. Um, if replacing the old service is a must, then you can still deploy a new service. I've already said that. Deep, duplicate the traffic, all that stuff. Um, for minor updates to an existing service, so say you've got like a typo or a small bug you want to fix, um, before you, before you uh, change that, you, you want to have multiple instances of your service in production um, and you know, load balancing across them or whatever. Uh, and then you basically update the microservice clones one at a time, and then you don't have downtime. And so during that, that period, some people might still be getting the old thing and some people might be getting the new thing, but that's all right. Um, how do you deal with running them in production? So for smooth deployment, microservices must be loosely coupled and independently functional. So if, if so, Sometimes, because people can be so set in the in the the monolith mindset, you find people building distributed systems, but in a monolithic way. And now you have the worst of everything. Um, so they must be loosely coupled and independently functional. Um, we use Seneca to help maintain boundaries and focus on business logic. Um, Use virtualization, containerization to encapsulate environments. Mathintosh's talk was amazing, loved it. Um, I'm totally gonna start looking at that HyperFS to, to help us with that. Um, we use Docker uh, currently and probably will continue to. Um, use tooling that simplifies deployment and maintenance and monitoring. Uh, apply version control to system topologies. Uh, and uh, we actually use Nscale for that. So we were able to describe our deployment plan. Uh, and then through time we can make changes to that plan and it's version controlled. So then we can roll back to different versions if, if we make a change and we deploy that um, and it turns out to break stuff, we can quickly reverse that change. Okay, so I'm a little bit over time. I've got time for a demo? Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, okay, so I'm actually going to start by going on to uh, Amazon. Okay, so I've got this uh, instant here. It's called Nscale, Nscale Pel Pelga. That's Peter Elga who set that up. Um, and that uh, is our control machine. That's the machine that we uh, actually launch other instances from. So on the control machine, um, I just realized I'm, you're not seeing this, are you? <laughs> slow because of the cool so what I've got here is um, when you do an when you with n scale when you create a system which I'm not going to do um, it creates this folder and it puts this uh, a definitions uh, folder in that folder um, so in the definitions folder, I'm really sorry about this, I'm going to use nano because like, I, I, I haven't gone to wizard school yet um, to learn V. Um, I do plan on doing that at some point, but I have been planning on doing that for some time. Um, so, uh, start with, yeah, services. So, we have a services.js file and basically we just use the exports object um, to describe containers. So in, in Nscale there's this concept of um, uh, the unit of deployment, which is the container. It's exactly the kind of stuff that Matt and Tosh is talking about. Um, so we have this container uh, and we describe different um, environments. So we've got dev, stage and prod. 
Uh, and in dev, we have um, the type of container is a process container. Because in development, we'll probably just like run apps and stuff. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is get people into a workflow where instead of just running node app, they're going to do like n scale deploy dev. Um, and that will deploy that on their, their machine. Because then they can quickly get then into the staging phase, which is Docker containers, particularly on your local machine. So you do the same thing, n scale deploy stage, and that will, will bring up the Docker, uh, build the Docker containers for you and put your services into Docker containers. And then they can all talk to each other instead of just on your process. And then after that, we have um, uh, prod, um, which is also Docker containers, but these ones will actually be on uh, an AWS instance, uh, which we describe here. So we describe a security group, the permissions of a security group, and then we describe a machine, and uh, the, machine, uh, the machine's parent is the security group. So what you would then do, and I'm not going to do it because I've already done it, is you do an n scale uh, system compile. And that would compile your um, specification into uh, the JSON files uh, that you can see there. Um, and then we, we describe the whole topology. And so we say we've got the dev stage and production environments. And um, if you take a look at prod, we have security, which has machine, which contains our uh, web um, process. Okay? And all of these are, are just boxes within boxes. So, so if I do uh, nscale system deploy latest, the latest revision, uh, the prod environment, we can see, uh, awesome. Sorry, nscale, as I said, we want to deploy the latest revision. nscale revision deploy latest. So that started to deploy that. And if I take a look at these uh, AWS control panel, you can see that we're actually initializing an Amazon web machine. And then Ensco is going to uh, SSH into that machine, start the doc build the Docker container, start it, and start the process in the Docker container. Um, the process that we have is um, this little guy. Um, So we're starting to define conventions for greenfielding a project. And the idea is that you set up a ping service or a ping route to start with. Um, and then you put that into your, the, the Nscale topology and you create a happy path for development stage and production. You make sure that works all the way through. Um, so if I just run this app, for instance, and then I curl against it, logo host 5, uh, 51,000 ping, we get a, a ping response. Uh, and that's what we're deploying as well. So it takes a while because, um, because it takes a while to spin up the container. I think that, mm, I'll see if I can give it a try. What's the IP of that? I'm pretty sure I just copied that. Port 51,000 ping. It's not ready yet. OK, so um, while that's still deploying, um, it's usually a little bit faster than that. Um, once you have that, that full path, the ping set up, um, you would move on to d defining uh, APIs or, or defining, um, sorry, patterns, not APIs. So we define, uh, in our sales tax API, we define this pattern with a role API and a path of sales tax. And uh, that, in turn, calls another pattern with the role of sales tax in the command calculate. Um, we also call another uh, pattern that's actually internal to Seneca, um, or it's a Seneca plugin. Um, where we we act on this pattern role web and we pass the arguments uh, where it uses the prefix for slash API and it pins to role API and then uh, wildcard on, on on paths. What that means is that uh, the, the forward slash API forward slash sales tax uh, will be the endpoint for this particular uh, message pattern right here. So that allows us to build HTTP endpoints for our services uh, when we when we want to do that. Um, 
So we'll also have another service here, um, Sales Tax Basic. And what that does is um, it adds a command, uh, roll sale tax command calculate, and then it will calculate uh, that f uh, versus a, a times that by a rate that's passed into the options, which is uh, defaults to 20%. Um, so, um, so with with N scale, you would just do an N scale deploy, and what that's going to do is going to do the, all the Docker stuff. So in this case, I'm actually going to do the Docker stuff um, by hand. Uh, I've already started it. So I would build the build the image. This is what nscale is doing under the hood when it deploys, and then run it. That's the API, and then build the other image. I've already built it, so then I'd run it, uh, and then we have two Docker containers running, and then I could um, I could test the ping on that. Yeah, got v2 there, and then I could test this this root here, uh, curl. Um, the boots docker IP API sales tax net 100 and it'll give a reply of total 120 and that's basically that's sending a request into the sales tax API um, service which is then call it, sending out another message which is being picked up by the sales tax basic service which is then sending out another message which is being then routed through as to the response to the HTTP request so that's generally how it works um, Let's see if that has deployed. Great. So that was so that's the the ping originally, but that was deployed with nscale onto the other machine. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a really quick preview because I'm rushing because I'm, I'm out of time. Um, but check out nscale, check out Seneca if uh, if you're interested in in microservices. Even if you don't use them, there's ideas there that you can that you can reuse. Thanks, everyone.